Hi, I'm Anjali Alapad, the host of ARCS, a series about literary inspiration. I have loved fantasy and science fiction for as long as I can remember. In these strange times, these stories are a wonderful form of escape, doorways to different worlds, offering glimpses into possible futures. In season two, I'm going to be talking to eight South Asian fantasy, sci-fi and speculative fiction writers to find out what really made them want to tell stories. We're going to talk about books, movies, TV shows, video games, and other media that shaped and influenced them as writers. Today, we talk to doctor and author Usman T. Malik. Usman's short fiction has been nominated for numerous awards and featured in several anthologies. His debut book, Midnight Doorways, includes some of these stories. A mix of horror, speculative fiction, and fantastical satire, Usman's work confronts the monsters under the bed and the ones wearing faces we all recognize. We discuss the importance of accurate history, authentic storytelling, the often missed nuances of Desi stories, and the horror of everyday realities. You can follow Usman on Twitter at UsmanTM. Hi, Usman. Thank you so much for joining us today on ARPS. Hi, Anjali. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. So to kind of start things off, could you tell us a bit about your journey as a writer? How did you get started? Did you always want to be one? So, Anjali, like most of us in South Asia, we all grew up with stories, right? And we grew up with poetry and songs and Westerners don't realize how musical we are as a people, you know? And so I think all of us have art. We are born into art. And somewhere along the way, it's hammered out of us, you know. This idea that a child will doctor or engineer, banega, you know, for the longest time was dominant in our part of the world. Because I think it was a very colonial thing. It was a survivalist instinct. No parent wanted. We didn't have the luxury to go to pursue art for art's sake. I have been reading and uh, my first publication was a letter to Bachonga Pakistan. It was a little tiny pamphlet that used to come with the Pakistan, the newspaper, which doesn't even exist anymore. I was in grade one or two, and I remember running around the house. Mera khat chhap gaya, mera khat chhap gaya, you know. And I kept running around the house, and I showed it to everyone. And that was my first publication, I guess, as a writer. So after that, it was just reading and a lifelong love for learning and stories. I shouldn't say learning; it was stories. It was a love for stories. The love for learning came later, but it was just curiosity and magic. If we have time, I'll tell you a little story. You know, we have Ramzan. And so in Ramzan, the 27th of the night is called the Lalatul Qadr, the night of fate or the night of mystery. And so the story goes that if you pray on the night of mystery, that's when the Quran is supposed to have landed on the, in the Prophet's heart, all your wishes will come true. I read that and I was like, oh my God, that means I need to figure out more and more interesting magical artifacts that I can wish for. So I started reading more and more stories about magic and enchantment and Amir Hamza, and Amar, Umruyar, and Tars, you know, they have they had Edgar Rice Burroughs' translation in Tarzan into Urdu. And I remember reading that, and I wanted the monkey, and I wanted the elephant, and I would just pray on it. You know, like, I want this, I want the magic carpet, I want the magic lamp. And so I think it's funny, it really triggered this love for stories. That's one of my earliest memories. So that's what I started. That's great. Um, and that's such a fun way to remember being enraptured by stories and wanting that in your life. Were there any particular books or media that really influenced your storytelling? Anything that stands out to you now? It does, absolutely. I grew up grounded in Urdu. I am the son of shopkeepers. I'm not the son of very literary people. And uh, which is unusual in Pakistan. A lot of Pakistani writers, they come from families that which are very literate or bureaucrats or, you know, pretty rich and well-connected. So I come from a very middle-class family. And so for me, Urdu was the main language of reading because my dad read in Urdu and English was just a more literate language for my family. And they didn't read. My father and my mom can't read my stories, for example. It's not ideal, but it is what it is. I mean, I was reading Imran series. I was reading Ibn Safi. I was reading Isma Chuktai. By the time I was in class six, I was writing my own poetry. I read Ghalib for the first time in class five or six, I think. And then I started telling people I understood. And then poets, actual poets would laugh at me. They say, you know, we don't understand Ghalib. You're like in class six and you're saying you understand Ghalib. I grew up grounded in that world. And Amir Hamza, the epics of Urdu, the epics of Persia, the epics of Mahabharata. We had condensed Mahabharata 
in urdu i remember reading that uh, which was very rare you couldn't find it everywhere but i found a copy and so all these great epics these stories and we of course in the 90s we i don't know if you know this but I, maybe you guys did that too but we certainly did we would go to the roof and we turn the antenna so it would point towards india so we could catch channels from india and then we could watch some of those black and white old indian movies about magic and devtas and these devis after class 6 i started reading in english i started with enid blyton and i think it was party boys and all that fun stuff and after that of course it was christopher pike stephen king arl stein actually i recently reread one of the christopher pike books and i still liked it i still thought it was effective i still thought it was smart it was intelligent it actually surprises me because i think i went into reading his books expecting an adelstein and got something very different i read a couple of his books and i just remember thinking like this is so way ahead of the game what aspects of pike storytelling really struck a chord with you as both as a reader and as a writer well he starts with character and his characters are memorable they're great and his ideas they're all good idea stories you know the book the eternal enemy isn't it good still it really is it felt like the first time i was reading it because i couldn't remember it to be honest and so when i went back to it i kind of thought it was going in one direction and it completely threw me off because the stakes became so much higher than i realized yes yes the stakes became real and they became cosmic right he started with a little character and he took it all the way the first time in my life i understood about what the greeks you know the indivisibility of the world and there's this idea where the grandfather is explaining this through the video right where he's saying that i discovered that below everything so if you take away there's an atom there's an electron there's subatomic particle there's quarks and at the bottom of it it's nothing and then suddenly i still remember this from 30 years ago I still remember the moment I hit that light went off in my head and I was like that's right because if there is something below it something below it something below it it will keep going ad infinitum so there has to be nothing at the end of it and that blew my mind that was like oh my god this is real so that sort of you know scientific philosophy is so powerful and i think also whoever wrote the blurb did it a little bit of disservice because when you are reading it you are expecting this kind of semi corny story about this teenage girl who's got a vcr and she is able to like predict the future because when she records something it shows her you know two days later or whatever the news essentially she uses it initially for really silly things like she has a bet with her dad about football i think and then the stakes slowly rise she suddenly thinks oh i can stop these deaths that i'm hearing about on the news and then she decides to go out there and you know save people's lives which of course has pretty catastrophic consequences because you're not supposed to mess with time and somewhere along the way things get much darker and it becomes much more of like a existential conversation than something as simple as what was promised really yeah and all his books i remember are like that i believed everything he would say you know we have that old st colridge thing right suspension of disbelief Pike was able to do that and maintain that, sustain that for me, and I was hungry for more. So I remember I I must have read several of Pike's books several times in my teens to catch that flavor. And you know, honestly, there are times when I miss that feeling of discovery. As an adult, when I read now, it's not the same. What do you think you've drawn from Pike's work and used in your own work? I don't know if I have drawn anything from Pike's work necessarily. I think that Pike and Choose Your Own Adventure books were my introduction to like basic science fiction. Because in Pakistan I didn't have access to a lot of science fiction books and you know frankly I didn't have the money to buy a lot of new science fiction books. My books came from old bookstores. So whatever I found there and golden age of science fiction adult books like Isaac Asimov there's a lot of science fiction vocabulary that you need access to before you can read some of those books. I didn't realize as a kid but Pike and Choose Your Own Adventure and later on some Isaac Asimov and Arthur C Clarke introduced me to the world of science fiction at a young age and by then I was already studying some science on my own physics chemistry bio because I was going into med school and my subjects in A levels were biophysics and chemistry there was this gap 
in my education, this gap of humanities or this gap of science for science's sake that I didn't really have access to. Pike gave me this sense of the world being a bigger place than I might have been used to and that the world of literature was a really big place. I always thought of myself as a horror reader or writer, but Pike was not horror all the way. There was so much science there. There was so much humanity in Pike's stories. And so I think he was sort of a great role model for a kid like me who was interested not just in science fiction, but in history and in poetry, in love, you know, that sort of all-roundedness. When you look back at that work, are there any themes that you would like to explore in your work in the future? I think I already am. I play with time a lot. I've written a few, well, not maybe time travel stories, but a lot of stories about time. I play with memory a lot. Memory and time and ghosts are themes that I keep returning to. Maybe that is a lot of Pike showing up 20, 25 years later. If you left it to me, I think we'd be talking about Pike and Stephen King and all the things you mentioned, including Doodashan dramas for a long time. But I also want to discuss Midnight Doorways. So for our listeners who haven't read the book yet, could you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, so Midnight Always is a collection of seven stories from the first decade of my work. You know, the original title was Midnight Always Fables from Pakistan. But when the book was bought by Hashat India, they thought the title would appeal to a broader demographic and they really liked that concision. Also, the word fables is something they thought would appeal to different marketing category. But really, Midnight Always is a very fabulous book. It has a lot of stories with fable quality. In my view, a fable is basically a lie that tells a truth. It's a fiction that tells a truth and it's a substitute for the truth. It's a sideways attempt at the truth. And so the seven stories here are stories about love, time, memory, nostalgia, and actually poetry. Lots of these stories are about poetry as well. So they are about everything that I love. That sounds amazing. And I'd like to invite you to do a short reading from the book. All right, I will read from a story called Ishq. And I don't think I need to define that word for our audience. No, I think everyone gets that one. Ishq. They whispered Parveen is in love with the Shakargandhi vendor. Figures, said the shocked neighborhood women. Fitting that the girl with polio who stood at her window every night staring into the ghostly depth of narrow alley would steal glances at the bright-eyed boy with muscles sharp and confident in his back and a smile on his lips. When Hashim went with his basket of steamed sweet potato up the alley, yodeling at the top of his voice, Shakar Gandhiwala, Shakar Gandhiwala, many a middle-aged lady sighed dreamily and leaned out of a window to watch him go. Come taste my way as his lilting young man's voice teased. Come take a bite of my sweet potatoes. And they wanted to go. Wanted to take their drawstring purses, abandon the baby carriage in the hall with its shit-stained linen, abolish all principles of a vaguely understood domesticity and run screaming after the sing-song boy. Wait! Oh, please wait! One packet of your shakagandhi, please. Take a moment, won't you? No, you're charging too much. Leave my alley now, you lying scumbag. But throw me over your shoulders and take me with you. Such sins that our daydreams are made of. The women watched the sweat of Hashim's labor trickle down the brown lobes of his exquisite ears, watched his bare chest shine with summer heat. And in the evening, they'd gather in the cool, sprawling gardens of a mosque wazir Khan and make fun of the boy. Who would ever go with him? They'd ask each other, wide-eyed and laugh nervously. Who would go with this lanky, young, beautiful fool who never stopped grinning? Seemingly then that Parveen was the answer. The pale girl whose high, gloomy room looked down upon the alley from a dusty window. Every evening she leaned out, red and yellow bangles slipping down her willowy arms until they shone in the dark like jewels. They clinked above the din of the street, kanak kanak, a soul song borrowed from centuries of Punjabi lore, and the girl's eyes would be restless and lusterless until they riveted on the boy peddling toward her house. Hashim's route was fixed. Each morning, he biked down the alley, navigating the narrowest points on foot. Come dusk, he walked his bicycle up, smiling, yelling to laborers and shopkeepers returning home to try his shakargandhi. He had a sweet, affecting voice, and when he was not hawking his merchandise, he sang Sufi love verses that pealed in the night like bells. <laughs> 
ਰਾਂਝਾ ਰਾਂਝਾ ਕਰਦੀ ਹੁਣ ਮੈਂ ਆਪੇ ਰਾਂਝਾ ਹੋਈ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਰਾਈਟ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਸੀ ਰਾਂਝਾ ਸੋ ਲੌਂਗ ਆਈ ਚੈਂਟਡ ਰਾਂਝਾ ਰਾਂਝਾ ਆਈ ਬਿਕਮ ਹਿਮ ਮਾਈਸੈਲਫ ਕਾਲ ਮੀ ਰਾਂਝਾ ਸਿਸਟਰਸ ਡੋਨਟ ਕਾਲ ਮੀ ਹੀਰ ਨੋ ਮੋਰ ਕੇਅਰਫੁਲੀ ਹੀ ਡੈਕੋਰੇਟ ਹਿਸ ਬਿਗ ਬਾਸਕਟ ਵਿਚ ਸ਼ਕਰ ਗੰਦੀ blossoms of sweet potato wedges sat skewered on two picks ring with slices of lemon a presentation to tempt the most jaded taste buds and the people of narrow alley responded they gathered around waited for him to sprinkle chaat masala over their perches and munch the shakargandhi all the way home it was on one such night when the boy clattered down the alley good naturedly tinkling his bell at pedestrians that he happened to glance up into the mountain black a stick figure stared down at him circlets of light at its wrists their eyes met the bangles chimed a new dark surged and the sweet potato vendor of narrow alley never looked away again i'm going to stop here thank you so much that was so lovely and you have a hell of a voice <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, so vidai toves is a short story collection as you mentioned before how did you put it together how did you decide what was going into this book so i'm not a prolific writer at all i have done maybe one or two stories a year for almost a decade maybe more my friend ellen datlow who's a very well known science fiction and horror editor one of the legendary editors of the field i reached out to her for advice and she's you know she kind of gave me a few tips she said you don't want to include all your stories you want to take the very best and represent the best of your first decade and so that's how i ended up selecting stories that i thought represented a wide range of my interests stories with different themes and flavors and so that's how the selection came to be and you know the sequence was easy after that i kind of just mixed and matched and i left the longer story for the end and how do you go about constructing the stories are there folk tales that are kind of your inspiration or because you mentioned fables before or are these kind of ideas that have come to you at different points in time based on real experiences i think it's all of it different stories with different ways a lot of these stories are stories that have fascinated me so for example if you've read the wandering city it's one of the shortest stories in the collection so the wandering city the city is actually the city of brass in the arabian nights and people who are night scholars or medievalists or just nights fans they recognize it instantly and they're very amused by my usage of that I was fascinated by the city of brass it's a brilliant brilliant story in the arabian nights corpus similarly the first story ishq about the narrow alley my father told me about the narrow alley and he told me the story about these kids chasing a cow into the alley in pre partition india and the cow getting stuck and then the kids you know the fetching adults who kind of threw ropes around the cow and tried to pull it out and how the cow's skin just got chafed and it was bellowing and crying and so what how can you forget a story like that and think about this right i mean we read all these stories set in the american south you know about god southern gothic and stories about people and we are moved by them and we like them and they become sort of a template but these stories are stories which happen every single day we just hardly write them and so for me it becomes an excavatory and almost a memorialist a sort of endeavor as well where i'm putting down these stories as quickly as i can and creating my own stories around them it's so interesting that you mentioned the city of rasvik because that's exactly what i thought about when i read it as soon as i read that i was like okay i kind of think i know where this is going but it did surpass my expectations i i enjoyed the kind of the dual tone of it like for one it appears out of nowhere and it's a sense of wonder around it but also i mean when it appears it kills a lot of people which is kind of brushed aside which again was so realistic to me if this happened frankly anywhere i could see this kind of capitalism at work where they would be like yes we have a memorial day for the brave people who died but at the same time i'm selling a toe <laughs> exactly that's actually why it's one of my favorite stories in the book i laughed the whole way through i was like oh this is too real and i mean it's horrible but it's true even the chapel charges right will charge your money <laughs> the chapel charges absolutely <laughs> i had a great time reading that one the other thing i wanted to ask about is why you're really attracted to horror and speculative fiction themes that is kind of what you're drawn to right and why is that 
I think that if you ask different people, they'll give you different answers. And I'm sure that if uh, someone was trying to psychoanalyze me, they would say that, you know, the kind of childhood I had demanded escapism. I mean, that may be true. But I think it's also true that magic is in the bone marrow of South Asians. I mean, don't we believe in religious magic? Don't we believe in miracles and divinity and superstition? And we still believe in them. We will go, a lot of us will go and, I don't know, work on a nuclear reactor and physics and come home and pray a couple of prayers to ward off the evil eye before we enter the house. So, and a lot of us don't see a paradox with it. There is a little bit of an interesting division there in our part of the world and in the Western world where, I'll give you an example. Um, we just had Pakistan's first residential science fiction workshop in Lahore. And Marianne Mohan Raj and Elizabeth Hand flew from the US to Lahore to teach it for a week. And both were kind of surprised and they remarked on this. The students were 14 students from all around Pakistan. One was from Manchester, one was from New York, who flew down here for the workshop. And all of them had stories and Liz and Mary and kept saying that, you know, because they're used to teaching Clarion in the US and in the UK. And they're like, you know, when we reach student stories here, a lot of stories have an almost sacred spiritual quality about it. They said that of all 14 pieces, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. Because for us, spirituality, religion, divinity, miracles, magic, it's all around us all the time. You've also explored Pakistan in both in contemporary and historical context in your work. And you often switch between those perspectives. Why do you like that kind of non-linear storytelling? I kind of think of time as a sort of character in your work. Could you tell us a bit about that? I like that idea of time being a character. I think it's very true. I don't know if I thought about that that way, but I think it is true. Well, you know, the thing is, Pakistan in particular, not India so much, Pakistan has really suffered a lot in the last 20, 30 years, much more than India or Bangladesh have. Bangladesh suffered horribly post-1971 or even before 1971, but they have recovered, they're on their feet, they are not the basket case of the world, as Henry Kissinger famously once said, the horrible imperialist statement that he passed. But Bangladesh, in fact, is one of the, I would say, one of the great countries of South Asia now. So Pakistan, on the other hand, has really been through the crunch, you know, sometimes deservedly, sometimes not deservedly. As a kid who was, what, 17, 18, when 9-11 happened, and going to the US for the first time as a young medical student and seeing the hatred and the horrible association with the word, I think it sensitized me very much to this idea that there's so much richness in this part of the world. And all of that has been completely shut. It has been completely thrown aside. And I think through my stories, I was really exploring that, not for the world, but for myself. It started with an exploration for myself. And then it started becoming a point of pride. Look, look at how much wonderful stuff is here in this country, in Lahore, in my city, which is 5,000, 4,000 years old. Lahore is named after the son of Ram. Right? So, I mean, it's that sort of history. It's wonderful. And it's been taken away from both India and Pakistan because of the split. And plus, you know, I had a very much a Pakistani identity for the first five years of being in the US. I was completely lost. I was a lost immigrant who was working six days a week in medicine and who had no clue if he wanted to assimilate, he was interested in assimilating, if it was even possible to assimilate as a Pakistani brown man who didn't know any other world. How do you think you've handled that over the years? It's obviously been quite a few years since you were so young and lost in the US. And you've continued to kind of move between those two worlds. The funny thing is from 20, 2009 to 2019, I only came to Pakistan twice. So for 10 years, I only came to Pakistan twice. And both times was for a few weeks. For whatever reason, my life allowed me a decade to figure out who I wanted to be. And by 2018, I was very firmly in the camp of a Pakistani American, which I am now. I don't think I can be completely Pakistani anymore, even though I live in Lahore, because I do have two identities. I have the privilege of the passport, the American passport, which is, of course, a privilege, a very powerful weapon, in fact. So I can never be a Pakistani anymore, not with the average Pakistani's problems of inflation. I earn in dollars. It gives me a huge advantage in Pakistan. I actually am rich now in a way, right? I don't think of myself that way, but I am compared to the rest of the country. 
and it sets me apart. I'm not that lost brown kid. So I think for me, it's my identity has definitely become more mature in a way that I've come to accept that this is who I am. I can't claim to be diaspora anymore. Neither can I claim to be indigenous completely. And it's all right. My son is 13 and he and I talk about this and he's very comfortable in his skin now as a Pakistani American who understands the privilege and the responsibility. And bringing it back to storytelling, how do you think that's changed as your identity has changed? I think my stories, they were very nostalgic from the beginning. In fact, my first story that brought me attention in the Western science fiction world was the vaporization enthalpy, which was a very angry story about American drone attacks all over the world, but specifically in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so that story was my science fiction response to drone attacks. And later on, when in 2014, those terrorists massacred 150 children in Aptabad, my lens changed. It went from anger towards one side to anger towards the other. And my decision to dedicate that story to the dead of that attack, where 140 children were massacred brutally by these terrorists. So, you know, as times changed, as I evolved, my storytelling changed. It went from pure nostalgia to exploration, to a fragmented identity, to my own work. And now that I'm in Pakistan, interestingly, I find my stories longing to be even more about space, even more about the histories that have been lost. You know, I have this great series of books by Abdul, Abdul Majid Sheikh. Abdul Majid Sheikh was this journalist whose father was an editor. And he walked the streets of Andrun Sher in Lahore all his life, collecting stories from the people who sat there on the streets. So he has like five big collections of, I don't know, a thousand stories that I had never even heard of that would have been lost to history had Majid not set out to collect them. So I recently found myself really roaming these streets. And now every Saturday, I try to go and visit some of these places. My storytelling, I'm sure, is eventually going to be influenced even more by it. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with it because that sounds incredibly fascinating. And also, something that I wanted to discuss was the perspectives from which you write. You kind of write from the perspective of outsiders quite a lot. And I'm not just talking about people who are like on the fringes of society, but sometimes I feel are on the periphery of bigger stories. For example, Ami and Ish. I would say that she's kind of the bystander to that love story. And despite wanting to see herself as like a central character and even the narrator from Dead Lovers on Each Blade, he's a really down and out guy who kind of gets this window into this crazy situation and then it ends slightly tragically for him. But why those kind of perspectives? Great reading. I don't know if I ever thought about it that way, but the moment you said that, instantly the first thought comes to mind is, well, I am that bystander, aren't I? Huge stories of histories have already happened. Huge stories of history and, and world history and politics and religion and architecture and the great ages of the Islamic Empire, the Mughal Empire, the Persian Empire. And as someone who likes stories, I was not there. I missed out. And so maybe I am that bystander who's trying to collect all these stories before they all fade out and who longs to be part of those central stories, but I'm unable to by default. So maybe that might be one answer. The other answer also might be because, you know, a lot of stories that I tell have, they are sort of frame stories. They're sort of stories about people telling stories about other people. An American editor who read my collection for some time ago, he said something interesting. He said that Usman Malik is very interested in gossip mythology. I thought that was such an interesting way of putting it, you know? How do you feel about that? He's not far off. I think there's something to that. Because maybe as kids, we grow up reading, listening to Mohalle's gossips, right? Isn't there so much gossip around us and there are bigger stories happening and as little kids moving between the adults' legs, we're always hearing snippets of these big stories which we do not understand. But we know something important is happening somewhere which we don't have access to. And kind of subconsciously, they become very much a part of the facts around us, right? Like you grow up sort of knowing things without a real context to it, but you know this one did that. That one said this, you know, and it is pretty important to the fabric of who you are. Exactly. The other thing you explore quite often, I think, is power dynamics in various ways. 
and I've kind of noticed that you have a very realistic and fairly brutal depiction of women's roles in society. And I don't think you're very far off. I think you're very on the dot for that. But something I really appreciate is that when you do talk about violence, it isn't graphic. And there's so much that's implied, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be in your face. And was that a conscious choice you made in your writing? I think it's story dependent. When the moment you said, you know, women's role in society, the first story from the book that comes to mind is The Fortune of Sparrows, which, uh, you know, the writer Amir Hussain said, that's his favorite story of mine. And I call that my Nayir Masood story. Masood was the Hemingway slash Kafka of the Indian subcontinent, possibly the most important writer of the Urdu short story, Post Partition After Manto. And so when I wrote that story, the story originally was about these women and this female orphanage and these orphans roles. And along the way, it became a story about something else. And if I say Phatava Chula, I don't know what that means to an Indian audience. So Chula Phatna became analogous to the murder of the new bride by the family. So if you go oh, back wow, and read okay. The Fortune of Sparrows with that in mind now, it will become a different story for you. So the Chula Patna story I drew from real life. When I was 12 or 13, we had a teacher, this man who was sort of a family tutor, who would go around teaching people after school. And he said that there was an orphan girl in his mohalla who was about to get married and they needed jahes for her. And so me and my friends and my cousins, we all got together and we raised 10,000 rupees for her. And we arranged that jahes for that girl and gave that money to her. Three, four weeks later, I asked him, sir, what happened to that girl? And he said, she died. And I was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean she died? I was like, yeah, you know, those people were not good people. And that's all he would tell me. I was 12 or 11 at that time. And somewhere I heard someone whisper, a chula phat gaya tha na unka. What that means is that with these kerosene oil chulas, these oil stoves, the sas, the mother-in-law or the father-in-law would just take the girl, pour it over her and they would burn her alive and they would say the chula phat gaya. So the fortune of sparrows became, ended up becoming about that story. And when that happened, I realized that this was not the kind of violence or graphic storytelling that I wanted to do. I wanted the story to be mysterious and I wanted it to be very dark, but dark only on the fringes. So only people who really understood what we were talking about would get the horror of it at the end. So in that story, if you go back and read, you'll totally read something different at the end now. I was going to actually go into that story a bit more because I did enjoy it. And I think you'd mentioned all these girls where the option was to be either married or migrate. And there was this kind of assumption that Sangeeta, who is one of the characters, despite being employed and older, she'd be so grateful to marry this man who's clearly not a kind one. And nobody saw anything wrong with it. Nobody tried to object. And there's this kind of acceptance that you'll never see her again, which now is even more chilling with this information you've given me. But it really struck me because in so many ways, we haven't changed that much. No, we haven't. And there's a line in that story, which a white friend of mine picked up. I mean, of course, it was deliberate, but he picked up on it. And he was like, the boy is 50. When they are introducing the Rishta, they're like, the boy is 50. So, you know, I mean, that sort of thing, it says so much by itself, doesn't it? It does. And I think in a lot of ways, you're kind of conditioned to be like, okay, this is a thing that happens. But when you're looking at it from a very stark lens and perhaps the lens of an outsider, you kind of see it for what it is, which is, yeah. you know, exploitation in the worst way. And in your other stories, you've also explored, and I think very beautifully, the aftermath of violence in various forms. So whether it's the quieter and mostly unacknowledged domestic violence, or the devastation after a terrorist attack, or something like as CD as gang retribution, how do you go about exploring that with nuance? I don't know. I think, again, it's really story dependent and situational. One thing I learned earlier on, as a young writer, I really liked that torture porn description, you know, because as a newbie writer, I wanted to feel all that and I wanted to see all that. But, you know, then you realize after reading a lot of good writers that so much of the horror, the real horror of the violence is in the mundane moments and in the one line 
description of the entire violence you don't even need to say any more in resurrection points for example there are moments of violence that are completely happening off screen it depends on what i want for the character what i think the character wants and how the character is looking at the world some people turn their face away and some people look at it directly so i think it is situational in that way you can very quickly turn off a reader by really just going through the mechanics of horror and violence because sometimes you don't need that sometimes a sideways build up in motion is maybe much more effective and i think you've hit on something which is very true in horror fiction you can just encapsulate so much in just a line and it can be bone chilling without really having to be gory you know absolutely i also wanted to ask you if there are any themes that are in midnight doorways that you would like to explore further in your work in the future anything you want to expand on i don't know if i want to expand on any of those stories i am working on a novel right now which has some arabian night like motifs to it i have an entire shelf dedicated to the arabian nights because i've become so obsessed with them recently my novel is going to feature a lot of arabian nights motifs i don't know if there are any stories that i want to expand necessarily when i wrote the wandering city it was written for arizona state university's csi platform and they put me in conversation with an architect with someone who specializes in urban planning and so this gentleman talked about this idea that maybe there could be an entire series of stories and anthology in which the wandering city goes to different parts of the world and there are stories about the wandering city in bombay and mumbai and kenya and whatever so i was like yeah i mean it sounds fun i'm not going to do that <laughs> but you know there could be a fun wonderful global anthology of wandering city stories where the city lands in different areas and people have different stories about it i'd be thrilled to read it to be honest <laughs> before we sign off because i've had a wonderful time talking to you but i also know that we have a time limit <laughs> i wanted to ask you if you have any new projects on the horizon you mentioned the book could you tell us a bit about it what can we look forward to well i'm fascinated by history as you can probably tell and i am doing a lot of reading about partition and actually after a long time i have become interested in india pakistan history and maybe because i'm living here now i went and visited this haveli in the last town before india you know we have the wagha border on that side we have amritsar and this side we have lahore and when i went and visited that village my car there were pagdandis a lot of these tiny lanes and i almost crossed over into india <laughs> So one of the farmers there he was like go back go back that's the border go back go back I didn't even have enough room to turn the car around I had to reverse all the way like half a mile <laughs> because I'd gotten lost and almost crossed over into India and so that haveli is in what they call the last village before India and isn't that magnificent just by itself haveli sitting in the last village between India and Pakistan So I have a novel that I'm setting in that haveli. Oh that's a great hook. Now I have to read it. <laughs> and that's all I will say about that haveli. But yeah, that's my setting. I have said no to all short story invites for the year. I want to focus because I've been putting off this novel for almost 2 3 years now. And I really want to get it done. Some people can work between things. I can't. I need my own time. I need several hours, half a day where I can seep into that world and think about it. And so I have said no to all short story projects. I am supposed to write one article on science fiction which I will probably do because it's for Rutgers. It will give me like an academic cred, I guess. But that's pretty much it. I only want to work on the novel and I'll probably get that article done. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it and thank you so much for joining us today, Usman. It was such a pleasure to talk to you and discuss your short stories and I can't wait to see what you do next. Anjali it's been a wonderful interview and it's very interesting i've noticed that indian podcasters or indian journalists or readers when you guys interview me the interview is so much more insightful and the questions are very thoughtful i think there is something to the reading when it comes from a subcontinental audience that it changes the stories too I'm so glad to hear that and thank you again. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Be safe. <laughs>
Ox is a mini series from the Subverse, the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice, and culture. Follow us on social media at Dark and Light Zine or visit darkandlight.com for episode details and show notes.